So I'm going to kick things off. Um, thank you all for joining us uh, this afternoon uh, in UK time. And I've got participants from all around the world. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And um, we're here to have a, uh, a seminar led by Ember to consider the very recent publication of the IEA's uh, pathway towards net zero, which uh, takes into account a new scenario that will be compliant with a 1.5 degree temperature increase. Um, it's a pretty historic break from uh, the, the experience of the IEA's report, um, and the, hence uh, Ember decided to pull together six expert responders to help us analyze this moment. Um, Dave Jones is the head of the global research. Ember is going to kick proceedings off with a presentation of the main uh, conclusions of the report, but we will then go into uh, six respondents uh, who will comment on different aspects, and then we'll open up for questions. So um, please, could you just look at the bottom of your screen? There is a Q&A function there. So please put your questions in there. And use, you can use the vote up buttons to select, uh, up select the questions you're most interested in. And then we'll, I will chair a session after the, the respondents. Um, please could you, if you want to direct a question to a particular respondent, please just say that in the question and we'll see if we can coordinate that as well. So um, I'm thrilled and delighted to be chairing this and uh, I, I'm really looking forward to what everyone's got to say. So I'm going to hand over very quickly to Dave and he's going to hand uh, talk us through what this report says. So over to you, Dave. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brani. Um, welcome to the webinar, everyone. Um, what I want to do is uh, to share with you uh, today our takeaways and also some of the evidence um, from the IEA's analysis so you know what they've actually said um, and the evidence they present so hopefully you can then use it more effectively in your own work on climate campaigning. Um, thanks to all the Ember team behind the scenes that have been busy uh, researching and helping with all of this and uh, really, really looking forward to hearing the, um, the other speakers on the call um, follow up after this. So I'll try and keep it short, hopefully to about 15 minutes. So our four key takeaways that we wanted to go through was, firstly, this is, we believe, the real deal. It's a comprehensive vision for net zero. Secondly, it's one and a half degrees as driven by clean power. Um, so 100% clean power by 2035 in OECD and 100% clean power globally by 2040. Thirdly, we want to highlight it, it needs everyone to make this happen. Um, we think that's a really important point to, to pull out of this. And fourthly, we want to make, uh, we want to talk about the bit that you're probably all here and interested to know about, which is that line about no need for investment in new fossil fuel supply from the IEA. So, um, so our first one is, we believe this is the real deal. And I, I love this tweet from this morning. Um, uh, there, there's a lot of cynicism around some of the IEA work in the past, and this does uh, this does mark a big turning point in the IEA. So I'm very keen to just talk a bit about why we see it as the real deal. And we had a lot of expectations on this report as, as others did as well. Um, we, um, that it was one and a half degree aligned, and it is that it's got reasonable assumptions in it. Um, yeah, mostly. Um, it's got that, uh, that, that line um, that the IEA used, and I love it. It's, a, it's saying it's a pathway to one and a half degrees. It won't be the pathway. So um, they want us to look at this as more of a roadmap um, rather than a, a specific isolated pathway. Is it achievable? Uh, they say it is. There's 400 milestones that they're piling through. It's not just a black box model they're sitting with in the background. There's a, a real action plan behind it. Um, is it desirable? Um, yeah, it's really nice. They paint a really positive story around it. I don't know if you've seen uh, any of the, the comms released today. It's a people-led story that will boost um, jobs and economic growth. And that's what we've all got to really rally behind, I believe. It does signal the end of fossil fuels, as you know, and we'll come on to that at the end. Um, it doesn't gamble with our future on risky negative emissions. The reliance on BEX on bioenergy carbon capture and also on direct air capture is, is much smaller than, than other scenarios. So, um, so that was really positive. Is it central to IEA's work? They say it's going to be in the WIO, the World Energy Outlook, their main um, report. Um, will it be the main scenario? Will it be like central in all their other work? I guess time will tell, but this definitely isn't a one-off report. How central is in their work going forward? We'll have to see. And lastly, and most importantly, is that this isn't just a, a model. We wanted it that is actually stimulating governments into action. And because it's integrated into the COP process, that is really, really exciting. So it's not just another report. It's one that the politicians are talking about over and over and over. And will it actually result in immediate action? Well, the more people that read the summary for policymakers forward it around, then hopefully the more people 
uh, will actually, or the more governments will actually take action coming from it. So, um, so we'll see how that actually works through in progress, but the signs are good. Um, I, uh, I, this is just pulling out and explaining that this isn't just a model. So these are some of the priority action bits that come out of this, and it's to bring it to life a little bit. The, it's quite a readable document with specific actions in here. Um, uh, the, the main report in itself is a modeling report and summary for policymakers is more a call to action than it is a, a model result. And um, uh, sorry, this, the slides are being a bit slow to update here, but um, the uh, the next slide was to go through the um, the IPC scenario. This is all just frozen uh, our side. Um, and what uh, Simon Evans have done, you might have seen this on Twitter, was to go through um, and to show um, how the IEA in the red bars ranks against all the other 1.5 degree scenarios analysed by the IPCC. Um, and in terms of CCS, it's, it's low to middling. In terms of wind and solar, it's high. In terms of bioenergy, uh, it's low. In terms of BEX, it's very low. In terms of low final energy, it's low, so a low, uh, high level of energy efficiency. And in terms of fossil fuel use, um, it's also low. So in all, like when you compare it against other scenarios, it, it, it compares very well on um, most of the metrics. Um, so uh, the second point that we want to talk about is that the IEA shows um, that one and a half degrees is driven by clean power uh, and that's uh, 2035 in OECD and globally by 2040 and let me just unpack some of this so this is a CO2 graphic they have in there you can see the power sector um, on that graphic on the left turns from the biggest CO2 emitting sector in 2020 to the only one to be clean by 2040. Um, and what we wanted to do was actually pull out the 2030 part of this. So where everyone is talking about 2050 in this report and looking at the total bit, we want to really isolate the bit that matters, which is what can we influence on the next decade. And when you pull out that water flow diagram about those CO2 emissions falls, the first one is to know the CO2 emission falls are really massive. We need to cut global CO2 by 40% this decade. That's uh, absolutely immense. Um, but when you look at where they're coming from, over half of that is coming from coal power alone. And much of the rest is coming either directly from the power sector on oil and gas or indirectly from the power sector via electrification of industry, transport buildings and others. So the electricity sector is absolutely critical this decade to put us on that path for one and a half degrees. Um, we had to make another couple of charts ourselves because IEA didn't have the quite quite the right ones. And um, and. Um, the milestones that they paint out is that emissions from electricity generation need to fall to net zero in advanced economies by 2035 and globally by 2040. Um, so what that means is down the bottom left, you can see the grey being phased out by 2040. So there's no oil and gas left in the generation mix and a massive increase in clean electricity to 2040, in part from replacing that fossil, in part just from the, the, the increase in electricity demand growth, which is coming not just from electrification, but like develop, the, 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 the world like developing more, more generally. And the graph that I really wanted to pull out that um, I, I don't think that comes across in the report at all is in the next two decades, when we get to zero emissions, all, uh, three quarters of all that new electricity generation that comes online is from wind and solar alone. So there's lots of people on this call which would be like have backgrounds um, uh, around the rest of the mix around nuclear bioenergy CCS whatever it is fine um, uh, they're gonna uh, play probably play some kind of role in, in in the mix going forward who knows but they've only got a quarter of that total pie to argue over and the more that we get on with building wind and solar um, and do it cheaply and do it ubiquitously um, the smaller that that pie will be, slice of the pie will be for those technologies. And a large part of those technologies won't actually be the energy they produce, um, the megawatt hours, it will be the megawatts of flexibility to be able to work around wind and solar within the electricity mix. And what do we need to be able to get that much wind and solar? A huge, huge step up this decade. So, um, so these are the IA numbers. Um, we need to be building a terawatt of capacity every year in 2030 of wind and solar, uh, wind and solar combined. Um, that means a fourfold step up for numbers in 2020. You'd have, you'd have seen the numbers that came out earlier this week from the IEA and everyone was really excited because 2021 and 2022 build rates are really cool and we're on this path of increasing wind and solar. It's like, well, kind of, but we're not on that S curve that we need to be that big exponential growth that gets us to one and a half degrees. 
and how do we deploy a terawatt of wind and solar? A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of money. So um, on the left is the investment side. Um, you can see that green that we've highlighted, a trillion dollars per year into renewable electricity on average this decade. Um, and that's twice the amount of fossil fuel investment that the world spent last decade. So huge amounts of money. Um, the other increase in investment I really want to pull out from this, and one of the bigger increase in the bars this decade is around um, energy efficiency. And, um, and they have this line in here about a major wide, a worldwide push to increase uh, energy efficiency is essential. Um, and that means this decade um, to be having three times the amount of energy efficiency that we've achieved in the last two decades. We really need to step on that. That's a critical assumption within their modeling. Also, to point out, because this is especially, especially relevant following uh, like the weekend comments you'd have seen uh, around John Kerry, but they come out with this line as well. All the technologies needed to achieve the necessary cuts um, in emissions this decade in tw by 2030 already exist. And they have this chart below, which uh, in blue, you can see 80% of the, 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 the emissions cuts this decade come from what they call, I'm just looking now, technologies in the market. Um, so this is like, we do need new technologies in the future, but to deliver those big emission cuts this decade, we have the answers. Um, there's two key milestones they pull out on coal. We said that coal's got to be half, coal power's got to be half the total CO2 drop this, this decade. And there's two critical ones that pull out that get to that by 2030. And the first one is, is the phase out of coal power in OECD and the EU countries, which I think everyone will be familiar with already. It's um, already been well documented from all sorts of sources. That's what's needed to happen to get you on a one and a half degree pathway. The second one they put in here that's new is um, the phase out of inefficient coal power globally, um, which you can see on the chart on the left. Um, and what we did is we did the chart on the right and split out where that subcritical and efficient coal power capacity lies. Um, and you can see China um, uh, there's, uh, has a lot of it. So if they're going to close all of that by 2030, they need to be stepping up. Um, then you've got India and then in fourth place, South Africa, who are going to need some kind of international assistance if they're expected to uh, phase out that level of coal um, as soon as 2030, because that's going to be a huge um, um, uh, thing for them. And then in the middle, we have the US, um, who obviously have their clean power pathway they're working to at the moment. Um, and it'd be interesting to see how that steps up for the 2030 ambition relating to coal. So there's these milestones for electricity um, and broadly speaking, what, what to get a 2050 net zero economy, we need a 2040 net zero global power sector and actually some milestones even before that to make that happen. And, um, and on the, the UN Climate Summit Agreement um, pledges that you would have seen last month, um, uh, there were some really big targets that have been announced for 2030 and we convert them back to 2018 versus 2018 emissions. It means um, um, that the UK, the, uh, the US, the Germany are going to basically plan to halve their emissions um, this decade, which is pretty cool but because they're such new pledges. Like we haven't seen the policies yet about how they're actually going to do it. And the IEA is quite clear about what needs to happen for that. It needs to be electricity taking the lead on that this decade. Um, and that means a phase out of coal and also uh, working to 100% clean electricity as quickly as possible. Uh, one note on electrification, uh, which is really interesting. Um, there is a, a lot more electricity coming online. So you're not building just to replace coal and gas power plants. You're, you're built to meet that ele extra electricity generation as well. So 50% higher, even by 2030, two and a half times higher by 2050, three quarters of that is in emerging and developing countries. That sounds like a lot, but actually when you compare it against other one and a half degree scenarios, it's less. And one of the reasons why it's less is because within the IEA, in their main case, they assume for chemical steel and cement, quite a high reliance on CCS as a, as a pathway going through. Um, and underneath that, they run some, some, some other scenarios within their net zero report. And it basically shows that clean electricity can substitute for CCS and also for bioenergy as well. So the more that we get on with wind and solar, uh, the more it'll prove itself that electrification is a route further up um, and that uh, um, it can be used more, uh, more effectively than the IEA uh, are giving it credit for at the moment. So I've got a couple of slides left. Um, uh, the third point is to really highlight how like we think that everyone needs to be part of one and a half degrees to make it happen and pulling out some of the evidence that uh, within the IEA report. So the, the first point they make a big part about is about how much inter international cooperation is required to make this happen and about how just one and a half degrees won't happen if you don't have that degree of, of cooperation going on. 
uh, every country needs to be doing its part. Second, it needs a lot of brain power. So we talked about, oh, we kind of got most of the solutions this decade. We don't for ne next decade or the decade after, we need new technologies, we need more innovation. And the, the IEA make, do make a big thing about all of that. So that requires a lot of people power. Um, the third one is, is um, it relies a lot on consumers making active choices. And this is a really interesting graph. In the, in the blue, it's showing the, the active consumer choices that people are making the carbon reductions coming from that. And in, in, in uh, green, it shows the, um, the behavioral changes, the, the, the cuts from, uh, uh, carbon cuts from coming from behavioral changes. And it's, it's more about the decisions that they make um, regarding their choices as consumers than it is around their behavior. Um, so consumers do need to play a big part directly in this. Um, the next part is around jobs. Um, the, it's the next creation of jobs. There's a lot more jobs. That's really exciting for the world. Um, but also some jobs will be lost. So the IEA really make a point around those policies that come in needed, needing to be fair and just and sensitive to that. And the final bit, which is really, really important about like the kind of everyone bit on all of this is, is the, the changes, the, the IA say the changes are mostly enabled by policies made by governments. And that's true for citizens. And it's also true for companies like the carbon cuts are coming from policies. So if you want those policies from governments coming out, you need a broad level of public support for one and a half degrees and all of the policies that come out of that to support governments in those decisions. So there is really the people power is really really critical to achieving uh, these are uh, this one and a half degrees. Dave we've got one more minute are you able to go through this last one quickly? I've got one more slide um, ah, so, uh, so the, uh, the, the one that everyone's been waiting for I saved to last there's not much to cover on it because the IEA don't actually say that much on it um, but I do want to read out the exact words they put on it because I was trying to think whether anyone could write them better themselves and uh, I, I'm not sure they could there is no need for investment in fo new fossil fuel supply then uh, in our net zero pathway. Beyond projects already committed as of 2021, there are no new oil and gas fields approved for development in our pathway and no new coal mines or mine extensions are required. That's really strong speak. As Greenpeace put it, the IEA has spelled that once for all, if you're in a hole, stop digging. Um, um, they show that there is some investment, but it's from existing fields, not new fields. In the top right, you can see that this is enabled because there's less fossil fuels that the IEAC say we need to be able to decarbonize. And um, I really like the, the wording that Glenn Peters had this morning. If you invest in coal, uh, oil or gas, you do so knowing it's inconsistent with one and a half degrees. And in an interview this morning on Sky News, Fatty was actually even more explicit than what he's been in the report, which is um, to use that phrase, junk investments. Um, and that this could also, uh, investment into, into oil and gas projects could throw domestic climate targets off course, which are pretty big words. And what I wanted to end on as a final slide, just to leave you with, was, um, was, was, uh, was this, um, was their, their roadmap. So I pulled out my thoughts from all of this. They have this awesome roadmap. I love Jonathan Gavendis. I want a frame print of this hang on my wall. And I, I think that probably everyone should and, uh, and kind of tick off these, uh, these achievements as we go along uh, the next three decades of, of, of energy transition, because there are some great ideas in all of that. And uh, I'd love for everyone as much as possible to share this report uh, from the IEA um, uh, summary for policymakers with the policymakers so they can act on it. Thank you very much. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Dave. And uh, thank you for almost keeping to time, which is awesome. I'm going to ask everybody in their responses to do the same and really keep their comments concise within the three minute limit. Um, I'm going to kick off with Maria Postikova from E3G. Over to you, Maria. Everyone and, and thanks for giving me the floor. Um, I will go with over several milestones um, this report um, has on gas and their implications, in particularly for the power sector um, in the industrialized and advanced economies. Uh, as Dave already mentioned, we have uh, a very ambitious power sector decarbonization goals. In this report, it's 2035 for the advanced and 2040 for uh, developing countries. Um, which will have profound implications for gas industry and the development of the gas market. Um, 
this re report will also trigger a reckoning in the gas uh, industry and a host of related sectors, aside from the power sector, from boiler makers, makers to utilities to commodities traders, uh, that they need to rapidly transform their business um, models to continue to exist in, in the 1.5 uh, world post 2050. But let me return to the power sector now, um, where the change is more immediate and uh, truly massive in scope, in fact. Um, the with these milestones, the IA basically offsets the growth of the gas projected by uh, of the gas demand projected by the gas industry. Um, if we take, for example, the outlooks by BP or Shell, uh, as a major chunk of this growth was supposed to be made uh, through the coal to gas switch uh, in the power sector. And uh, looking at the pathway, uh, the IA suggests for the power sector we see that this role of gas is just isn't there anymore. Um, when we look at the uh, when they break it down by the developing and the industrialized targets, uh, among the developing economies, we'll see three main groups. Uh, first one would be economists already really highly dependent on gas in their power mix, uh, and where coal is really marginal, uh, and instead they use renewables or nuclear or, um, or hydro. So uh, these are most of the Gulf, uh, Gulf region countries, North Africa, post Soviet space, including Russia. For them, Switching to gas is not an option anymore for decarbonization because it's already they're already so so highly dependent on it. The second group would be low-income countries where power grid is still poorly integrated or absent, and they're highly dependent on distributed oil power, oil-based uh, power generation, where um, the most cost-efficient thing um, uh, would be to switch to low-cost renewables. Uh, uh, combined with, with the new sources of flexibility. And finally, the bigger group um, where economies are heavily dependent on coal right now, and this includes the uh, economic giants such as China, India, but also um, Philippines, Mongolia, m many countries in, in Asia and the Pacific, in fact, um, we see that their, um, the bulk of this, their transition will be straight from coal to clean, will need to be straight from coal to clean, to clean but there is a very, very short term window for, for their gas demand to grow as part of this, this inefficient coal in particular might, might be switched to gas uh, until 2030. So if we put this short term, short term window for growth in gas demand in this last group of countries together with a projected reduction of um, gas use by uh, 2030, uh, um, or by 2035, uh, and, and with the target the industrialized countries have to decarbonize their power sectors by 2035, we see that there is basically no no space for growth in gas uh, demand in the power sector in, in, in Europe, in the USA, and in all other advanced economies. Great. Um, yeah. Let's stop here. Yeah, is that okay, Maria? That's perfect. You've done your three sure. minutes. Yeah, okay. Perfect. Okay, thank you so much for that perspective on uh, the implications of gas. That's really interesting. Um, moving on to Vivian Lee at SFOC. For, uh, from Solutions for Our Climate from South Korea. And uh, this, I'll just start out by saying, you know, this report comes in a very timely uh, timing because we have the um, President Moon and President Biden summit on Friday. We have the P4G summit next, next weekend. We have the G7 and we're a guest country. And then we have the UNG and COP and so forth. So it, it just comes in a very timely uh, manner. And uh, I can just also mention that, you know, um, at the Biden summit, Korea did not announce a new 2030 pledge. Uh, so that's still in a discussion and there are active discussions happening in Korea. And just to see IES report saying that, you know, OECD countries to be, uh, they need to be on clean energy uh, by 2035. Is a, is a kind of a push that we needed from an international community and from someone that we can rely on is because IEA haven't made such message that it, it makes Korea focus on this new message uh, by the IEA. So I think this will definitely push uh, Korea to the right direction and also give a spotlight to Korea to see if they will actually make a new 2030 pledge in line with uh, this announcement and the date of 2035. Um, and we also uh, are very uh, pleased to see that, you know, the, another message uh, coming from this report is that Korea should not steer to retrofitting CCS or natural gas or LNG discussions too easily because this is actually being discussed right now. Just yesterday, uh, there was a National Assembly discussions on, you know, possible exceptions uh, to the uh, phased out coal power. So I, I think, uh, you know, this is a low hanging fruit for Korea to say, oh, we can easily steer to natural gas or LNG as an option. But this report clearly says that's not the way to go. 
So that's really important for us uh, to see that. And in response to that, then, of course, wind and solar will be the very important uh, response to uh, the missing gap. And uh, Korea is working on it, but it's not done fast enough, not ambitious enough, and it's a matter of motivation for Korea. So uh, it, it positively impacts Korea on that. And, um, you know, I saw in David's presentation today that there, are, there was a small uh, note saying that changes are mostly enabled by policies made by government. So, I mean, this is a very clear message to the Korean government that you are the one making the decision and your policies will be reflected um, in, in Korea's energy uh, form. So we, we just launched from SFOC in partnership with the EU, we just launched a, a GCAM scenario of 2050 carbon pathways of Korea's current uh, NDC trajectory and we're, we're far off uh, the trajectory. So. I, I would personally, you know, uh, thank Dave for inviting me to this panel and to tell all the audiences that we need to push Korea into the right direction. And this IEA report is a strong um, backbone to that. So I'll just leave it at there for now. Thank you so much, Vivian. Um, this is just an example of how reports coming from bodies like the IEA, which carry so much weight, can have that ripple effect. So thank you so much for sharing that. Over to Rebecca Williams now at the GWEC. Thanks, Bryony. Uh, so, yeah, I'm Rebecca Williams and I'm Director of COP at the Global Wind Energy Council. Um, I mean, we hope that this report is going to be a massive wake up call to governments around the world. We're really pleased to see the ambition in there on the wind and solar figures, and we shouldn't underestimate that ramp up rate that we're seeing. It's going to be absolutely massive. And just to put that into context, I think it says in the report we need to quadruple wind. At the moment, we're only installing 90 gigawatts of wind annually. And we need to be absolutely transforming our approach to the deployment of wind and solar and, and building that out. The problem is that uh, we're seeing a lot of warm words at the moment about wind uh, and solar action uh, and not much on the ground policy making to achieve it. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm just looking at, at the, the ambition in the report and wondering how, how we are going to achieve that, considering that around the world, we still have priority dispatch for fossil fuels in many markets. In, for example, in Mexico, we've just seen new laws put in that, that will kind of reverse the, the deployment of, of renewables. Even in countries like Germany, we see really slow permitting and build out of, of renewables. So really, this, this just isn't going to do itself. You know, we, the, the global wind industry is there. We want to support governments in this transition. And we're ready to we're ready to deliver. We have, we have all the building blocks in place, but what we don't have is that policy framework to support this. And I think there's a lot of time spent uh, kind of distracting ourselves with this this final piece of the pie, as Dave was saying. You know, this this remaining percentage of the pie, focusing in on things like CCUS, etc. When actually, in the next ten years, we just need to go hell for leather in deploying wind and solar, and that's where the focus should be. So uh, we'll be calling really strongly on, on global governments as part of our COP campaign to really get serious about the deployment of renewables. And that's absolutely what we want to see and what we hope this report will, will stimulate. I'll leave it there, Bryony, because I think I've been forceful enough in, in our ambitions in this respect. No, that was, that was excellent. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm sure we'll get some interesting discussion around that point. OK, um, now moving on to the men, <laughs> I would like to introduce uh, King Smith-Bond at Carbon Tracker for his response to this report. And he told me he's going to be quite bold in his response. Well, thank you. <clears throat> thanks, Bryony, for the introduction. And thanks for um, uh, uh, four excellent uh, observations. So I, I shan't repeat what people already said. I think. Um, uh, to start off with a, um, what I guess seems to us obvious, but maybe controversial observation, which is that um, we need to realize that this is a game-changing move from the IEA. So the IEA, uh, for the last 10 years at least, has been the kind of shield for the fossil fuel system to enable the fossil fuel system to carry on going with business as usual and to pollute with impunity. And I can't count the number of conversations I've had with people saying, we can't do this because the IEA um, forecast is X. Now, finally, uh, they've realized what's actually going on and they've stepped up to the plate with a very different perspective. And they're finally telling us what we and many other people have been saying for a long time, which is that we can do this. So that's great. Um, and I think what flows from that is that rather than relying on the tired old models to defend the status quo, uh, 
people no longer have any excuse to stick with fossil fuel incumbent thinking. Um, and they're gonna to have to change their, their thinking quite radically. What that means in turn is that there's a huge risk uh, to the fossil fuel system. So the IEA is now saying that uh, if policymakers, as Rebecca says, step up to the plate, then we've seen peak fossil fuel demand in 2019. Uh, peaks means that you get lots of stranded assets as they also talk about, and uh, much less money flowing into the petrostates. That means massive risks in the fossil fuel system, which means that investors need also to wake up and get out before it's too late. Um, and I think the banks are particularly at risk. The banks have been greenwashing. The banks need to turn this over to their risk departments and realize that they can't just get out of all these stranded assets at the same time. Um, and, and then I, I, I'm gonna give a brief critique. I mean, it's great to have the IEA stuff, but uh, as a professional analyst, I wanna give a little critique about um, their modeling and what they're saying. And, and the first point and the most obvious is actually they're incredibly cautious about renewable costs. So solar and, and battery costs have been falling at 18% a year for the last decade. The IEA is now telling us that that rate of growth, of uh, fall of costs is gonna to drop to 5% uh, over the next decade and then to, to, to one to 2% after 2030. That's an extraordinarily bold call to say that the, the rate of cost falls is suddenly going to stop. Um, and if you look at the analysis done by Doyne Farmer or Marta Victoria, um, and, 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 and Ramez Nan and many others, actually that's highly unlikely. Costs are likely to continue to fall rapidly and much more rapidly. And that has enormous implications. It means that they're talking about very high costs. Actually, if costs continue to fall, uh, the costs will be considerably lower than they're expecting. And then the other point I would make is that the IEA has made its, its classic usual error um, of expecting a massive slowdown in solar and wind deployment and particularly solar deployment after 2030. If you play with the numbers, they're expecting solar deployment growth of 22% a year between 2020 and 2030 is probably about right. Uh, that's the kind of level it's growing at right now. But after 2030, they expect that declines to 8% a year for the next decade and then 3% after 2040. Neither of those numbers I would suggest is credible. Um, and and it, again, if you take what the work that's been done, my final observation, Brian, I'm not gonna go over my time, but um, they've got these kind of soft comparisons that they're doing and they're comparing to IPCC work from three years ago with five-year-old data. I mean, come on guys, step up to the plate because that's very, very old. You know, if you want to do proper comparisons with genuine fresh thinkers, then look at the work being done by Reistad, look at the work done by, by the Energy Transitions Commission. They've got twice as much or three times as much solar in 2050 as the IEA has got. And what that would mean in turn is that the transition would be much cheaper and you wouldn't need so much biomass and you wouldn't need so much CCS. Again, I, that's slightly, that's kind of like second round detail, but it's also worth uh, thinking about. I'll stop yes. there. Thanks, Bradley. Fantastic. Thank you. Right. We've got two final speakers. Thank you so much for keeping the time, guys. Um, I'm going to turn now to Bruce Robertson from IEFA. Oh, and you're on mute. Sorry, Bruce, you got the, you got the booby prize there. <laughs> Never a good move. Uh, look, I just wanted to give a, a, a little bit of a, a different perspective, I suppose, more from the point of view of what's actually happening on the ground. Um, you know, um, with with gas globally, there, there is a tremendous push on for um, a massive expansion of gas on the ground. Um, Australia actually has a, a, a gas fired recovery plan which involves opening up new gas basins in every single state and territory around Australia with the exception of Tasmania because they don't have any gas down there. Um, but, um, and, and also we have the expansion out of Qatar, which is the world's second largest LNG producer is looking at expanding its fields by 64%, which is a massive expansion. So, Net zero is not lining up with what's actually happening on the ground um, and, and, um, and, and in this IEA report. This IEA report is very welcome because it, it does signal a complete change from them. Um, you know, they have been the fossil fuel shrills um, and, and um, you know, really, I suppose, um, one of the things I was going to do this year was take them to task about their forecasting, but that doesn't seem to be necessary anymore. Um, look, I, I think the, the other thing is on the ground last year with methane, methane, if you look at you know, greenhouse gases in totality, methane was 25%, is 25% approximately of all greenhouse gases. And um, methane growth in 2020 was the fastest rate since 1983. 
the fastest rate in a COVID recession year. So we've got a lot of work to do to rein in gas is, is what I'm saying globally and, 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 and um, make it fit with the IEA scenario for, for net zero uh, by 2050. Um, there's an awful lot of work to do in gas globally. Okay, well that was, is that, sorry we've got to cut across you. No, that's it, You're that's done? it, okay. thank you. <laughs> yeah, right, brought us back down to earth, right, and now we're going to move over to Armin Cohn from the Keynote Task Force, over to you Armin. Thanks, Brianne. Uh, it's a dense report. <laughs> just gotten through it in the last day. Um, I agree with much of what's been said. Uh, clearly, uh, in particular, it's pretty clear what has to happen in the next decade. But I do want to highlight um, the maybe the less popular parts of the report, which speak to CCUS nuclear as balancing resources. Again, they aren't, as, as Dave pointed out, they're not a major part of the discussion. But uh, the report does note that they do play some essential roles uh, maybe they won't be needed. Um, you know, maybe we can hope that they won't be needed. But, uh, but if if they are, they will be quite important on CCUS. Um, you know, important for hydrogen production. Uh, if we're going to do BEX and DAC, um, uh, as a lot of people think will be necessary. Uh, industrial emissions. Yeah, we might be able to electrify everything. We might not be able to. Um, so I think the one of the messages that comes out of this report is that. While it's clearly going to be a wind and solar dominated world, uh, some of these other technologies are important hedging uh, technologies that we might want to do a lot of work on in the RD&D demonstration uh, mode so that if needed um, in the 2040s. I would point out that, um, you know, as Dave noted, uh, it's, it's a quadrupling of annual uh, supply additions for wind and solar. I can tell you in the United States, I'm doing work in California and uh, Iowa and other places like that, where uh, the the rate of deployment of wind and solar have slowed down significantly because of citizen opposition. And I know people say, well, it's only 2% of land to build all this wind and solar, but people live there and uh, it is, uh, it is, it's not a slam dunk. So there are risks all around. I note that um, the report does in include a, a roughly a tripling of, uh, of increase in energy efficiency improvement. Uh, about two thirds of the reductions come from what they call behavioral changes or places where people have to be actively involved. And not everyone in the world is like people on this call who are actively interested in climate and energy. So again, I think there's a, a generally optimistic view on this, um, but several of these technologies such as nuclear and CCS could play an important uh, role. Uh, just one final note, just quoting from the report, that if if nuclear is constrained or if CCUS are constrained, um, the report uh, suggests we need something like an additional uh, 2,400 gigawatts of wind and solar to compensate, 500 gigawatts of additional batteries, um, 200 gigawatts of some other dispatchable capacity to meet this sort of seasonal fluctuations of wind and solar, additional 3.5 trillion investment. Are any of these numbers right? Probably not, all models are wrong. But I think directionally what this suggests is that a net zero future uh, would be well supported by um, kind of a risk hedged approach that, that doesn't shut off any bet. Wonderful, right. Thank you so much, everybody. I was hoping we'd get 20 minutes of questions and here we are right on time. Um, people are asking questions and I'm going to kind of uh, choose the ones that are being upvoted and, and apply a bit of chair discretion. Uh, so please do look at what's already been uh, tabled and uh, add your new ones or vote on ones that are already there. But um, if, if we could also keep the responses quite snappy so that we, we can get through as many as possible. I think the first question, which is perhaps the most, it was very interesting, is what has caused this paradigm shift at the IEA? Um, what do we know about the process? I mean, I hear from you that it got improved through peer review uh, in that it became uh, more ambitious, specifically on that upstream fossil fuel supply point. Um, so how, how, what do we know about how this process has come about and, and what's driven it? Dave, do you want to kick us off? 
Um, I probably, um, Patty was actually mentioned it at the start of his presentation this morning and that it was responding to pressure from governments. So specifically governments were less interested in exactly how to get to one and a half degrees. It wasn't top of their plate of priorities. And like, as time has gone on, um, okay, it's six years after the Paris Agreement was signed, but as time come on, it, it has actually, it is now like an integral like concern and, and like, and, 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 um, and um, of governments across the world. So that was what the, Fatty suggested himself in terms of their drive for it, which means it's coming from the people that matter in all this, which is great. Any other reflections from anyone? I think just to add to what you were saying, Bryony, um, yeah, we were uh, pleasantly surprised by the ambition in the win numbers from uh, earlier drafts of the report. So great to see that um, <laughs> that ticking upward of ambition, but you know, as, as I was saying in my comments, uh, the deliverability aspect does need need thought. But um, I think it shows that as part of the peer review process, you know, there, there were comments that were taken on board. So good to see that happen. For me, it was a massive surprise that uh, the, the, the lobbying was positive lobbying through that process rather than negative lobbying. Normally when you can go through a draft and you read it, it's like, I bet that's not in the final version, um, and, uh, and and it all was, and plus there was more. So, um, like for me, I, I like it, it. Kind of reads as the death of fossil fuel lobbying. Um, um, actually, things are being lobbied in the opposite direction. It's a win for the climate community, awesome. and for many of the people on this call who've all been uh, actively trying to get the IEA to uh, wake up and look at the more modern uh, data that's out there. So congratulations, I think, are in order. Um, I'm going to turn to a specific question which has been voted up, uh, which is about specific countries. I mean, this is a global model, right? But what can we interpret for you know, the implications for individual countries and including southern oil producers like Uganda? Anyone? I know most of you are power experts, so perhaps this is a bit unfair. Um, does I'm anyone happy, have a few? I'm happy to talk about the um, emerging market story, Barney. Um, yeah, okay, go for it, King Paul. Well, look, I, I think the first point, the starting point is we've got to realize that the fossil fuel system is incredibly concentrated. Um, only 20% of people live in countries, or 80% of people live in countries which are net importers of fossil fuels. And, and actually 90% of the exports come from countries that are just 10% of the global population. So places like Qatar and Australia and stuff. Um, so, you know, on a global population weighted basis, you've got four times as many people who are going to benefit from a shift out of fossil fuels into renewables. So that's, that's got to be your starting point. Now, the second point then to make is, precisely as the IEA says, is if you're in a petro state and you're relying upon the revenues from fossil fuels to sustain your socioeconomic system, then you've got to rethink and you've got to retool yourself for the new world. And you know, there's two options really, either we tax the poor in order to send the money to, to supply more, more baths, golden bathtubs to Saudi princes, which I don't think is terribly fair, or um, we allow the world to change. And, and it seems to me that that's definitely the right answer. And then the third point is, you know, for a country like Uganda, which is actually a prospective fossil fuel exporter, not, not yet a serious one, um, the answer is very clear. You've got a lot more renewables than you've got or ever will have fossil fuels. And that's a much greater resource, in fact, and the fossil fuel resource. So mine the sun and mine the wind, and don't think about mining the old industries of the 20th century. Okay, anyone else want to comment? Yeah, I was just gonna come in on that one actually. Um, sorry, Maria. But I, I think what Kingsmill said there was, was really pertinent because um, really it's a kind of adapt or die thing, isn't it? And the countries that move fastest and embrace this transition and this revolution are gonna be the ones that benefit in economic terms. They're gonna be the exporters of skills and, and goods in the future. So now is the time to really refocus your economy rather than waiting till later down the line when you won't be able to do anything about it or benefit from it. Can I just, sorry, I mean, I suspect the challenge here, though, is that essentially without any kind of big policy shift, you're talking about, you know, an exportable commodity, which has got a market that you can get a price for. I mean, to shift to wind and solar, you've got to also then hope that there'll be the transmission networks to export it, or you can turn it into a liquid, uh, you know, commodity and export that. And well, I mean, both are quite expensive, so it, it needs massive policy change if you're going to expect Uganda to not do this, though, surely. Yeah, a massive policy change, uh, 
definitely. Uh, I think that's why the global approach is really important and also the role of, of multilateral organisations in, in helping provide that finance. Um, so, so yeah, that, that is a challenge, but I, I think that's why it is so important that we do have this global approach and partnership. Okay, so I not add very quickly on that, sorry. Um, um, I think if you look at the international landscape and the MDBs and other international finance institutions will take the recommendation of IEA of non-new investments in new oil and gas fields seriously, uh, and implement this, and uh, at least the Asia Development Bank and the World Bank, I think, are on the right track there. Um, then, then these countries are basically forced for, uh, will be forced to reconsider their their um, their revenue uh, mix and and try to diversify because nobody will just finance all these new oil and gas fields. And and this uh, concerns not only Uganda, but for example, Tanzania or Nigeria in the gas sector. Uh, so uh, th this massive shift will, I think, half be forced upon them. The other half uh, uh, must be leveraged also by the international cooperation. And uh, the IEA has also a very clear recommendation on that. They have this graph uh, portraying uh, the trajectory by 2050 with international cooperation there. And, and without, uh, we, will, uh, we will achieve the same targets only by 2090. So uh, that, that's a strong prerequisite for everything to happen. Okay. Yeah, Brian, Brian, just a yeah. comment. I think um, that with regard to the future of the oil and gas industry, there is a very interesting amount of chatter going on right now about what does that industry have to offer in the transition? And there are at least two things in this report that suggest there may be some role. One is certainly hydrogen and ammonia become uh, relatively important cogs in the decarbonization machine, and they know how to handle liquids. Um, they, their blue hydrogen has some role in these scenarios, um, we can argue about how big, but it is likely an important niche role. Um, also dealing with carbon management, um, whether we do DAC or we're talking about industrial emissions, they know how to bury things um, and drill. Um, so, you know, it may not be all gloom. I do see some chatter in the oil and gas industry about beginning to shift as well as into renewables and transmission, but beginning to shift and thinking about liquids and, and gases as being uh, kind of their niche in, in this future world. So it may not be a complete dead end for them. So what, what you're saying is that they will still pursue their chemistry set uh, while you know, acknowledging that electrons are going to dominate, right? This is this is the big shift, isn't it? That anyway, I will uh, maybe one, one gonna... more point, Bryony, but we're already seeing that happen. I mean, if you look at a lot of the oil and gas players, we're already seeing them transition into things like floating wind, hydrogen. So just to support what Armand's saying there. Yeah, and we absolutely need their skills and expertise in that. And with geothermal as well, you know. Anyway, look, uh, I wanted to ask, uh, there's a question being uh, posed about the energy efficiency part of this plan. And that does seem like a, a heroic uh, uh, kind of part of the modeling. Um, how much of this is to do with just the sheer inefficiency of primary energy? You know, like two thirds of the heat getting lost up the chimney uh, and, and how much of it is truly behavior change? Because if it's the latter, I feel a little cynical, but can anyone, does anyone know the numbers? Dave, you're smiling. I was hoping I'm, I'm, I'm muted and I was hoping he might step on this because he, <laughs> he, he was talking about it on his response. Um, I, I, I'm not familiar with what, what the IEA have said specifically around this. I wish I yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think the, Brian, I think it's, it was a 3X increase in end use efficiency improvement rate, not, thermal, it's not thermal losses, but I'd have to go back and check. I, I think the uh, significant point is that it, um, the other point I would make is I haven't, I'm going to dig in and see what they're assuming about developing world consumption. I'm assuming it's like previous reports and the global South is expected to remain at much lower consumption levels than the OECD. So I think that's another questionable assumption in this. Uh, um, Brian, can I, can I just comment on the efficiency point? So basically, global efficiency has been running at one half to 2% a year, and they expect it to go to four, which um, looks like quite a big stretch. Um, the reason why it's not quite as difficult as you might imagine is that when, well, precisely as you said earlier, when you shift from, um, just to do with the way you count it, when you shift from uh, coal or oil to electricity, you, you're massively increasing your efficiency because instead of losing two thirds, you're basically losing five or 10%. Um, so, so actually as the share of electricity in the system increases, the efficiency by definition is gonna increase quite quickly. Um, so, so there's a kind of playing with numbers issue there as, as well. And then this point about the, the global South using more energy. Um, 
Look, I mean, they will use more energy. It's just going to be renewables. Why wouldn't you? I mean, why would you buy the old expensive, dirty assets of the old system? You know, I think on that energy efficiency point as well, I wonder if EVs are classed as end use efficiency because you know, they're like so much more efficient than a combustion engine. And maybe that's anyway, perhaps part of it. We, this feels like an area that needs more digging into, but uh, um, okay, we've got 10 minutes left. Uh, anybody else coming in with new questions, please do so. I'm, I'm gonna now just shift our focus onto China, if I may. Matt has come in with a question. Looks like Chinese unabated coal needs to drop by uh, 3,000 terawatt hours by 2030. Um, any comments on that? <laughs> uh, I, I'll start off and we'll see where it goes. Um, the, um, at the UN Climate Summit last month, there was a whole load of announcements by different, um, by different heads of state. Um, the one that came from President Chu was um, basically saying in the first half of this decade, um, it will be about peaking coal and the second half of the decade will be about reducing coal. And it's nice to be able to see those words, reducing coal this decade come into, into it. Um, but the gap that needs to happen to, to completely slash that level of coal power within China is absolutely insane. And I, I am not sure if like within um, Chinese policy making, what they're thinking around that, if they're factoring in um, these scenarios that we can see within the IEA, which is for a massive fall in coal. But however you cut the pie, there needs to be that massive fall in coal power and China is over half the world's coal power. So like it, it does need to make that fall. There's no getting away from it. So, um, so I I guess we need to see what what comes out of them and out of all the bits big bits of gap of, of, uh, that was missing in terms of like emission cuts at the moment it's that announcement uh, in my opinion it's that announcement around china and coal anyone else want to come in on china well i mean on china to, to state the obvious if china's in policy is is aiming for 2060 and this report is 2050 then by definition it's 10 years earlier than, than the current chinese policy um so you know, there's then a secondary question about whether or not um, uh, reality will be ahead of, of policy in China. And I suspect it will be simply because of the very um, rapid growth of solar wind. Specifically. Just, just, just on that point around 2050 versus 2060, the, um, the, um, I forget the the name of the lead um, Chinese academic that wrote the what the report that justified why 2060 was uh, consistent with one and a half degree pathway from China's perspective. Um, like underneath it, you've only got the same carbon budget. It's just moving around when you're going to put that carbon budget. So 2050, 2060 is not that much different. And within that that um, that that Chinese paper, they had the different scenarios for what needs to happen. And to um, to power sector emissions, and it said that on average those power sector emissions need to fall by two thirds by 2030. So, like, however you cut the pie, it's got to be that massive fall in coal power uh, in China by 2030. Yeah, I'm not sure if Farman wants to comment, but um, I mean, this is something we, as a foundation, are spending a lot of time thinking about, and um, it, it feels to me that being such a planned economy. Um, they are going to take quite a, you know, hopefully quite a dramatic look at their power system transformation now. And it, but it feels like it will be an all of the above technology solution for them because they don't have the gas. They're not going to want, you know, I mean, they're exploring the gas, but their transition isn't going to go through gas in the same way that perhaps the US and Europe have. So I think you'll see, you know, three or four technologies, including advanced nuclear playing quite a big role in China assuming that they can uh, series build and get the cost down. So it'll be, it is the one to watch, it feels like. Anyway, right, we've got five minutes left. Um, uh, there's a question about how do, some of the definitions in the report. Dave, I don't know if you're able to, while you're also sitting there, answer some of the technical questions that have come in for us. Um, but there was one I thought was interesting, which is about what, how do you define new when it comes to these you know, additional assets um, that that shouldn't that there's no need for new oil and gas. What does the new mean in, um, in the report? Does anyone know? Do just just on just on the clean definition that was our definition the iea say net zero um, emissions is the phrase that they use net zero emissions so anything that's not and that includes ccs that includes nuclear in their definitions um, um there was another question around high skilled jobs versus low skilled jobs from christopher that said um the iea say two-thirds of the new jobs being created are high skilled they've got a nice chart on that um, and then on the question, that, uh, the other question around how do they define this, this, um, this no fossil fuel investment and the phrase they use is no, cons um, sorry, is 
uh, old coal gas that are under construction or improve, approved as of 2021. And we couldn't find, I don't know if anyone else in the call wants to add to it, but because it's quite a critical point, but we couldn't see any breakdown of what that meant beyond that phrase of um, cons under construction or approved as of 2021 because it's an essential phrase to like how we define new fossil investment. Okay, more digging required to understand what their models mean. Okay, um, moving on to a couple of questions around what, what we do now, right? Um, and one question that's come in is, does, this, does, the, does the IEA produce, producing a report that sets out a relatively credible plan open up new opportunities for campaigning? Um, uh, specifically, you know, does it, does it enable courts to take decisions on licensing challenges or um, what other mechanisms might there be that could help really put the focus on the big emitting countries like the US and China? Um, that, so those sorts of questions. Anyone have, want to offer an, a solution or a, a thought on that? Bruce? Yeah, well, just from a financial point of view, the IEA modelling is important uh, when, when we're talking to banks and financial institutions and insurance companies because, you know, for some reason they are held with um, almost like forecasting gods. I've never worked out why because they're forecasting awful. Uh, but, but um, uh, you know, what essentially it's saying is, is that a, a lot of these assets are going to be stranded and people are gonna lose a lot of money. And um, I, I actually think campaigning on the money is a very, very effective way um, to you know, throw a spanner in the works here because if, 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 if we have a look at it, um, people don't like losing money. And if they're saying that, the, that these assets are gonna be stranded and, and for example, gas fields aren't gonna see out their life, um, people are going to lose a lot of money and investors are going to lose a lot of money. So it's a, it's a pretty strong argument to, to take to, to banks and insurance companies and indeed investors. So I, I, I think that there is a positive takeaway from a campaigning point of view, particularly on, on the financial side. Question, Thank you. I, have a, I have a question to kind of put back to Bruce and maybe Maria, and Maria might want to chip in. Like, uh, to what extent does this actually like reset like stakeholder expectations now around these companies uh, saying that there's no fossil fuel investment required? Because that was something that was posed to me today. Does this now mean that like the investors and civil society need to demand that no fossil fuel investment is made? Can we go as far as that? Uh, yeah, look, I think certainly we can. Um, um, I, I, I think certainly we can. And, and look, the, the, the chilling figure for anyone investing in these, the, these sectors is, is that gas, for example, um, which is one that this just happens to be near and dear to my heart, but, but gas is going to shrink by 5% per annum after, after 2030. Well, no one likes investing in sectors that have compound shrinking growth. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, basically, um, you know, so, so um, look, I, I do think that, yeah, no, I, I think there's tremendous opportunities here. Does that sort of answer your question, Dave? I'm not sure I've entirely answered it. Maybe you better prod me again. Um, Maria was going to come in. If, if I may add very shortly on this, um, I agree with, with, with what Bruce just said and maybe add that this gives us the, the argument or the strength to push against this usual um, explanation by the international public finance institutions when they do finance uh, such such projects that that the recipient countries actually demand this and they cannot deny recipient countries in, in in what they deem necessary for their economies but this apparently is not unnecessary anymore at least or or this is this is even not needed on the way to 1.5 and this is what we uh, in campaigning to the international public finance institutions we really should push for look there is a pathway and this is really not needed uh, there are other things this money is more needed in like like the power transmission grid infrastructure like the wind and solar which need, need to be ramped up uh, dramatically which energy efficiency and this uh, and all, all of other things so i think that's basically a very strong argument both for private and public sector in finance Okay, Funny. I'm going to draw it to close there, unless anyone's got something super urgent they have to say. No? Okay. Look, it, thank you so much for uh, joining us in this, and, and thank you, Ember, for putting it together. Um, it feels like this is going to get a lot more uh, drilling into and, and discussion. Uh, it's, it's a, it does mark, I think, a watershed 
in the way the IEA has been engaging on the topic of climate change. We've got to keep the pressure on because they've now got to translate this report into all their other reports uh, that they produce. Um, there is clearly a lot of campaigning still to be done to make this pathway anything like a realizable uh, roadmap, um, both on the negative side of calling time on fossil fuels to stop digging and on the positive side, which is creating those enabling conditions where capital can flow into the solutions and minimizing all the barriers that are potentially going to come up and stop that uh, vision from being realized. So loads of work for the campaigns uh, that you all represent to get keep going with. Um, I've really enjoyed this session. Thank you so much. And uh, look forward to uh, maybe another one like this, with perhaps in six months time when we've had a bit more time to look at how it's landed and we've got through COP and we can see if it's had an effect. But I feel like it will have an effect. And I think it's uh, all down to a lot of pressure from many of the people who are on this call. So thank you so much. And uh, if we haven't answered any technical questions, I'm hoping Ember's going to download them all and send you some sort of response. But thank you so much. And uh, we'll hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.